Black Magic Woman podcast acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this episode on. We also acknowledge traditional owners of the land where you, the listener or viewer, are tuning in from. We would like to pay our respects to our elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was Aboriginal land and always will be Aboriginal land. Welcome to the Black Magic Woman podcast with Mandanara Bales. Thank you so much for jumping on to another episode of the Black Magic Woman podcast and for our listeners and also our viewers on YouTube. It's great to have your company here on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal peoples. And just, it's so amazing to come to a city that my family have been connected to since at least, you know, well, in terms of my grandmother's family. The Gwigal people, you know, when you think about it, my ancestors would have seen the first boat arrive on the shores here in Botany Bay. So this is my spiritual home, born and raised here on Gadigal country from the block and Redfern um, is only one stop actually. You can see Redfern in the distance, one stop from Central Station. So this is where I, I actually do feel more at home here, even though I've been in Queensland for the last 25 years. So now that we're here, we've got uh, an amazing guest on the podcast and you would have seen already with some of the promo that's gone out, Taylor Reid, my titter, you would think that we have <laughs> at least sat at the same table and had dinner together because we're in the same circles. Yes. But we've never had a moment to literally say, hey, I'm Mandanara. Hi, I'm Teela. Yeah. We're on Insta. We're on LinkedIn. We've been in the same venues, but we have never actually just sat. Mm -hmm. So this is the first time, believe it or not, that we've been able to have a yarn. And we get to share this yarn with all of you mobs. So you're in for a treat, uh, be assured. Sis, can you please share with our listeners and also our viewers, tell us your mob, a little bit about, you know, where you grew up, your peoples, your country. And even if you want to talk about some of your earlier experiences of growing up as a black woman in this country. Well, Yama, it is so nice to be here and share this space and hold this space. And I think creating these spaces for for these yarns is such an important part of this storytelling um, that we grew up with especially if you were born and raised on your country in your communities and I have been really lucky to have you know had that upbringing um I'm a Rajri and Walwan woman um from a little town called Gilgandra out in central western New South Wales so in the very middle um of the state and my story is you know I'm I'm the eldest of my maternal kinship and the eldest granddaughter, I should say, of my maternal kinship. And so the previous generations before me being born and raised in that little community were all forced onto missionaries. So my story, you know, is really I feel like um, one of learning, also one of liberation and opportunity, um, but it's not lost on me that what I have is absolutely part of, you know, what my ancestors fought for. And... So that chance to kind of really learn from my old people around the campfire. I remember growing up, my granddad would always have a campfire in the front yard of my nan's garden. And I was really lucky to be raised in a house across the road from them. And so I'd be marched off to school with my piggy tails, you know, in uniform. And then I just had, I remember the feeling in my gut going to school that it was a very foreign place. Um, walking through the school gates, like I was getting a very different education inside those gates. Um, marching off to the school quadrangle and having to say the school creed and, and sing the anthem and look up to a flag that, you know, the Australian flag, it just does not represent me. And back then as a millennial, um, I was um, raised, I guess, 
in the education system at that formal schooling level when Howard was Prime Minister. So that really shaped um, how I navigated that space as, a, I would say, a millennial. Um, you know, he had education policies coming off the back of the white Australia policies about the no arm, you know, no black armband approach to education. So I would walk out of the school gates in the afternoon as the sun would set and, you know, walk down and throw my bag in and then my pop's campfire would be blazing. So I'd go and change out of my uniform and just sit around and make cups of tea for all the elders and then I'd get a completely different um, education. And so it started to dawn on me those stories that uh, my old people were telling me were very different to what the school was telling me. And, you know, I remember um, just starting out in high school and my granddad talking around the campfire about how he was fighting to get his stolen wages back. And I didn't really understand the significance of it at that time. But in hindsight, I remember asking my nana as an adult, like, oh, you know that time um, when Pop was fighting for his stolen wages and um, you know, how much was that? Because, you know, he didn't never got paid, eh? And she goes, oh, you know, he well, you know, back then I think it was around the late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, she's like, oh, I think he got, you know, $8,000. And I'm like, for all my lifetime of work? And she went, yeah. And I just, there was a real injustice to that. And prior to that, because I was the eldest granddaughter in the maternal kinship, my granddad would march me off to all of the lands council meetings. So my childhood was really shaped by the land rights movement across New South Wales, out into the Central West. Um, those stories and those experiences, I remember being a toddler and in rooms of black fellas, um, talking about the history of our struggle and trying to get our land back and then going to school and just feeling very torn and confused about what I was learning. And being raised on my country and born on my country, I don't think white Australia can ever feel what we feel as black followers, which is this feeling of being foreign on your own land. Mm. A lot of our mob explain it or describe it even as, you know, feeling or even being treated as a refugee within our own country. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've felt the same feelings. Like you said, white Australians in, in particular will never feel that. Mm. And they usually question us about our identity mm. or how much Aboriginal we are. And, like, they have so much pride in the title of being Australian and I just don't feel an affinity with that word at all. I and hear. I think that's such a more profound, you know, when you travel the world and you um, start to explore the world and you start to reflect on this country. Like, I've lived overseas, I've travelled, um, and I remember one time being on a long-haul flight and I sat next to this um, old old middle middle age middle class white woman um who was american and she's you know started to talk to me kind of you know gentle and friendly in the way that you know they can be and i just rem when i told her my story and i'm you know a first nations person from australia and she she just looked at me really confused like do they have black people down there mm. i was talking to literally my a uh, few drivers here in mm -hmm. sydney um, they're all Sikh religion, the Sikh people. Mm. Most, you know, if there was a black black transfer company, you would you take off. <laughs> so the next best thing is is some other brothers from other mothers, mm. and he said that his family sent him to Australia mm. to do studies because it was a white country, mm -hmm. like England, like America. So he, he chose Australia because it was considered and regarded as another white country mm -hmm. as you're going to get, a, a, you know, the best education mm. and have the best experiences. And he said, you know, little did my mum and dad know that I can't get a job as an engineer. Mm. I'm, I'm driving and I'm doing Uber 
but I am highly qualified, mm. but I cannot get a job in 2023. And I said to him, it's interesting that the fact that you're on the receiving end of racism and discrimination, mm. it actually stems way back mm -hmm. to the relationship between white Australia and black Australia. Yep. And that's something that you're quite passionate about, you know. Growing up in the same movement, the land rights movement, my mm. dad. Of course, of course. Really you know, great. being the inaugural yep. chairperson of the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council. Yep. And in 1988, the year of the bicentennial, I, I was five. Mm. I remember being in Redfern Oval. I remember being at the protest. Mm. I remember my dad broadcasting back into Corey Radio. Yeah. And talking about, we got the Walpree mob here, come from all the way. We'd never seen. Aboriginal people from the desert before, mm. traditional, painted up. It was an experience that, you know, being at the front of the protest, mm. being in the household where those those um, meetings about organising the protest. So I've had a very, which I didn't know this until now, I've had a very similar upbringing to yeah. you. And I think, you know, exactly what you've explained about your dad and our old people, poop particularly like in particular the black fellas who really instigated the land rights movement here um yeah in, in what is now called new south wales um we have to i think really elevate and continually tell those stories because um people forget that we fought for land rights before there was native title and that you know, land rights meant land back and and in a way where we can re-establish our relationship with that land. One of the stories I feel like that gets totally lost in the movement as well is the power of the women who spoke up at the time, like Pearl Gibbs and Mum Shirl and how they played such pivotal roles in, again, bringing that loving and caring and storytelling um, energy to the black space and the mm -hmm. black movement. And Mum Shell, for people that don't know Mum Shell, Google her, there's a bronze statue of Mum Shell in Redfern Street, Redfern, and Auntie Donna Ingram, big shout out to Auntie Donna, has the Redfern walking tour and talks about the history and the movement of being a community member from Redfern and she takes people to Mum Shell yeah. and talks about the history. I've got a photo mm. at Marowina Preschool of Michael Jackson and Mum Shell. No way. I do. I remember the moment wow. that he came to our preschool on the block. I've got to find it. I've moved, you know, Blackfellas, we move a hundred mm. times, right? Yeah. You hardly have anything from your childhood. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it's still this big. Michael mm. Jackson's in his leathers, he's black, with his black little curly hair. Mm. It was the 88, um, 1988 bad tour. Mm. I remember him in our, at Marowina. Yeah. So Mum Shell, amazing. So That's I love amazing. the fact you're talking about yeah. our, our matriarchy. Yeah. And, you know, what people don't know is her first trip out of this state was to meet Vincent Lingiari in the top end where just before they were about to all walk off Wave Hill Station, you know, and so much was happening around that time. Um, our people here demanding land rights, calling for treaty, um, continually saying our sovereignty never ceded. Um, and then what happened as a result of that activism was here in New South Wales, the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Rights Act, the Northern Territory has um, an Aboriginal Land Rights Act, and there was a pivotal test case up there which was called the Gove Land Rights Case where the Yongle people took on um, a mega mining company, Nabalco, for their land rights. And this is 20, 25 years before Mabo. You know, and what happened was they got all the way to the Northern Territory Supreme Court um, and didn't appeal that to the High Court because of the potential risk that would happen if you appeal something, you know, to a High Court. You can also, you're bearing the risk of a negative consequence, you know. And so what happened was um, there was rolled out as a result of both the activism here and up the top end, uh, the Woodward Commission, 
which then resulted in kind of this inquiry into land rights. That set the foundation for 20 years later, a test case, which we now know as Marbo. Yeah, the Marbo in the High decision. Court. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't think we should ever forget that, you know, this what your people did here, what Mum Shell did, it swept across New South Wales. Um, and people are still demanding land rights way before native title. And, you know, that's the area I practice in now. I'm a senior solicitor in land rights. In New South Wales, we have over 30,000 undetermined Aboriginal land claims just Today, in New South Wales alone. 30,000 undetermined Aboriginal land rights claims just in New South Wales alone. Correct. I have never heard that figure, but I know, and people talk about it, mm -hmm. that these claims are in the thousands mm -hmm. and some of these claims were lodged 20 to 30 years ago. Yep. Is that the process, that length of time roughly for mm -hmm. these claims to, what does it, go to court? What, what's the process? So initially it's more an administrative process. So um, off the back of um, our people really activating the land rights movement, the government um, implemented in New South Wales the Aboriginal Land Rights Act, which provided a mechanism to put land claims over particular parcels of land. And um, about 20 or a bit more years ago now, um, the lands councils um, put a number of land claims across the state. And we have to really think about the fact that land rights is about getting land back freehold. It's not about native title. It's about getting our land rights the same way a white fella sees their rights, you know, to the exclusion of all others um, under the law. But that's um, also a very different relationship to what we have with the land ourselves every day. And so it is a huge amount of work. Um, there are incredible people that are working in this space. They make the claim and the reason there's so many is because the minister um, has either not determined the outcome of it or has determined the outcome of it. And so, for example, um, some of the matters I've worked on are appeals of the minister's refusal to um, determine that claim is claimable. So is this the Minister for Environment, um, the Minister for who? Lands what? and Environment, yeah. Okay. In New South Wales. So we've got a lot, there's a lot of work to be done in this state. I think people forget that, you know, they can look at, New South Wales and go, oh, look at those black fellas or, you know, they're all down, they're all the Southerners. And I think actually in many ways we have borne the full force of colonisation. We have our ancestors fully were the front line in the bloodshed of the colony. And even my own people, you know, in Wiradjuri country, that story going through there when the Crown declared Martial law, which is war on the Wiradjuri people in 1824, um, and Windradine led that resistance on the Wiradjuri country. You know, we have been fighting this battle at the front line for so long, and I think that we absolutely have to remember the legacy of those people who demanded land rights because their stories absolutely matter and that we have to continually elevate their legacy to remember what we're fighting for today. Yeah, and that sometimes gets caught up in... The politics. Politics, and black fellas get caught up in that as well. Mm. I love the fact that um, we've got black women mm. in law, right, used to kind of, you know, on the front line, in a way, trying to support our mobs across mm. New South Wales. How challenging is it for you to keep doing what you do? Because you're not just practicing law; you're been big part of the Uluru, um, the statement from the heart. Mm. You've been out there advocating at so many different places. I've seen you speak. You've been writing opinion pieces. Do you have a book? You got a podcast? Like, there's so much. <laughs> How do you keep t tell share with our listeners a few of the other things that you're doing? Because mm. if you haven't heard of Taylor Reid, now you have, <laughs> and there's a lot more that we're not going to cover in just like 30 minutes. Mm. But what else do you do other than 
turn up to work at Chalk and Bread. <laughs> so I have um, a residency, which I'm in now at Sydney Law School, which is more to do with the public advocacy. People probably know my work through more the public lens. Um, I had a very um, small but key role in the process that underpinned the statement from the heart. And that was about, you know, facilitating conversations about the race power in Australia. I mean, that might be a yarn for a whole different podcast because it's a lot um, in terms of how systemic racism is absolutely entrenched in this country. Um, so, yeah, my public advocacy in that space is one thing. Um, I have a podcast over at the Listener app called Black Matters. It's really about centering black issues in everyday life. You know, we often see um, when only when things are trending, and unfortunately, in our spaces, it's it's sometimes negative news. You know, um, what we have to live with with is the rising incarceration rates of First Nations women. Um, Aboriginal deaths in custody. And so that podcast is really about the fact that it comes from a yarn in which my friend Michael and I would have anyway. You know, we over a cup of tea or a coffee, um, we're very passionate about the issues. We grew up together um, grappling with kind of the similar, like gr the, the stories. Yes, um, he's non-Indigenous, but at the same time, absolute confusion I think in in a millennial sense that we understood something was off here and so that podcast is really just about centering black issues and making sure that people are doing it in everyday life because we shouldn't wait until something happens I mean black matters every day mm -hmm. I love that I was talking to uh sister a Lebanese sister uh, Antoinette Latouf talking about um just uh, minority groups and model minorities and talking about um, racism but also how, you know, other migrant communities have also now kind of assimilated into kind of white society mm. and they're also now part of the racism as well that we don't, we don't just copy from one side from white Australians. You've got the other groups, whether they're Lebanese, Greeks, Italians, Vietnamese, Chinese, they've come here and then started to take on mm. a certain viewpoint that the dominant culture have held towards us. Yep. There's an episode there where she talks about, um, you know, some of her family members when the Black Lives Matter movement mm. happened, mm. you know, which is not our movement here in Australia. One of her cousins was like, all lives matter. Mm. <laughs> and she was like, what do you mean all lives matter? Listen to you. Mm. Whose land are we on? Mm. So here's a sister trying to do some of the heavy lifting as an active ally. Mm. So there's an episode there for people if you want to listen to how she's trying to unpack yep. some of her own family's beliefs and views about us as First Nations peoples. How do you navigate conversations with you know, not just white Australians, but I'm pretty sure that you talk to mm. other groups in this country that, have, you know, feel privileged to live here, the land of opportunities. This country has provided their family with, you know, I don't know, jobs and, mm. you know, their kids were afforded good education. Having these challenging conversations with white fellas is challenging enough. Yeah. Do you find yourself having these challenging conversations, especially with your work, with the Uluru mm. step from the heart, with the kind of non-Anglo and non-black communities? I think part of the yarn is really kind of reminds me a little bit of what Stan Grant has said in his recent book, The Queen is Dead, which I highly recommend that book. Um, it's about whiteness being an idea. It's an illusion. It's what people buy into to come to this so-called Australia. You know, and I think Australia has to actually get to the point of accepting that it's a white racist colony in order for us to be able to move through um, the difficulty of where we, you know, the work that that's required to get done. I think there's so much healing that needs to happen um, and it won't happen until, you know, you accept there's a wound. And the wound is that um, this country has built been built off the back of 
the First Nations peoples and in particular First Nations women. And I think, I don't know how you find it, but sometimes walking into a room and saying who you are is so confronting to some people because it makes them feel so uncomfortable with the fact that there is an educated black magic woman. Well, wearing a red, black and yellow T-shirt, we're going to be off to the Qantas Lounge soon. Yeah. And I... I know that I'm going to. Because you don't, you don't fit the stereotype of what you're no, supposed to be in this place. No, but also I'm wearing earrings mm. that also make people uncomfortable. Yeah. That says white Australia has a black history. Yeah. So people are less likely, um, less likely to want to converse with me mm. on the plane. Mm. And sometimes I think, should I take these earrings off? Mm. Should I have changed my shirt? Mm. So that I don't make people feel uncomfortable. Yeah. So I, I get it. And it's taken a long time mm. for me to go, you know what? I'm going to get on my plane this afternoon to the Sunshine Coast, which is a very white, vanilla, you know, it's regional Queensland. Yeah. Um, and, and even just be in an airport on some days and on a plane where you're the only person of colour. Mm-hmm. Have you experienced that? I mean, in the profession <laughs> I work in, I'm very much sometimes the only black person or person of colour in spaces. But we've got Sudanese, mm. Tongans, mm. we've got Chinese, we've yeah. got all of these other, in fact, yeah, 300. But you have to remember some of them actually buy into whiteness. That's exactly right. I know, I know. But in terms of Australia being such a multicultural society with at least 300 different nationalities, Mm. you don't see that represented much on the sunny coast. Right. So it's like a different layer of feeling like you don't belong. Mm. Yeah, back to that kind of what I was trying to explain about being that young girl you know, the Koori kid in central western New South Wales feeling foreign on my own land. Mm. Like the ancestors are living in us. And I think white Australia, you can't translate that for them. I've tried to, they don't get it, which is fine. But at the same time, the fact that our ancestors live in us creates for us an obligation to show up every single day in spaces to speak our truth Mm -hmm. and it does not matter you know what you wear what you look like it's what's inside at the end of the day and um I that is that is something that weighs heavily on me the responsibility as a Wiradjuri Wawan woman to never um back down from my own convictions and to live with integrity. I mean, there's stories in my family of my great-great-grandma, Elsie May, who who fought to get a police officer out of his uniform, you know, like, and she didn't do that through violence. She did that with her words, with her passion, with her conviction and standing up for her rights. And I think that there are ways in which Australia expects of us a particular stereotype and there is a movement where we're actually not fitting their stereotype and they ha- that's the work they have to do, not us, in mm-hmm. being able to, I think, shift biases and be able to actually come to terms with the entrenched and systemic racism in our country. Um, yeah, I mean, growing up and stepping into spaces where you're not losing that internal part of you is absolutely part of i think creating the change mm-hmm. and you know, it's, it's such a great way to wrap up the yarn is if we don't step up mm. who's going to do it for us cuz we need to do a lot of the work even with some of you know non-aboriginal peoples our allies advocates our supporters it's crucial that the 97% of the population see that there is a role for you to play and for you to learn your history in the place that you call home, that's your responsibility. Mm. But we can support with some of these conversations, with podcasts, um, with resources. Can people find you easily? You've got an Insta handle. Yep. Yes, you've yeah, got a books at Tila Reed on the black all books. You've got. I've got Black Fella Book Club as well. I forgot to mention. There that. you go, Black Fella Book. Black, we're going to do another podcast. Yeah. 
You can reach this deadly black woman on her socials. We'll have them in the show note. But we need to wrap up because I need to get to the airport. I know, bless um, I just want to say it's taken so long, but it was so worth the wait to finally mm. have you on the couch um, and to have this yarn. So thank, thank you. you and keep on doing what you do. You're an absolute inspiration and I hope that my daughters look up to you and can see – especially the fact that you've been able to achieve what you've achieved. If you can do it, so can they. And that's for anyone. Mm. It doesn't have to be our young black girls, mm. our daughters, our nieces, but we need more role models. Mm. We need more, you know, people like us. Yes, all the space, creating the space to know that you can genuinely have these yarns in a way that's true to our old people that respects our ancestors and we might be, you know, living, working and walking on this land in 2023, but this always was, always will be First Nations land, sky and sea. So on that note, I told you you're in for a treat. I can't wait to get you back. We're going to have a longer <laughs> yarn. We're going to go for an hour next time yeah. and talk about all the other things that matter to us as black women. I hope you've enjoyed this yarn. Until next time, bye for now. And thank you. Thank you. Yalu. If you'd like any more info on today's guest, please visit our show notes in the episode description. A big shout out to all you Deadly Mob and allies who continue to listen, watch and support our podcast. Your feedback means the world. You can rate and review the podcast on Apple and Spotify or even head to our socials and YouTube channel. And drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. The Black Magic Woman podcast is produced by Clint Curtis. Mm-hmm.